Welcome, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to another one of our Facebook Lives on COVID-19. My name is Dr. Katherine Baumgarten, and I am the Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control at Auctioner Health. And today, I am thrilled to have with me Dr. Maurice Scholas. He's a physician for pediatric physical medicine and rehab. You'll also notice that we have ASL interpreters um, along with us today, which is great. Thank you for being here, both of you. Um, if you have Wonderful any questions, please leave them in the comment section and we'll try to answer them along the way. Um, we will address them as we go if we can and then at the end um, if we have additional time. Uh, because a lot of our discussion today is going to be about vaccines, I wanted to first talk about the vaccination rates. In the United States, there have been over 234 million doses of vaccines administered. Hard to believe when we think about this a year ago where we didn't even have a vaccine. And 29% of the U.S. population is fully vaccinated at this point. Louisiana has given 1.2 million vaccinations. Those are the number of people that have completed the vaccine series. And over 2.5 million doses have been given um, completely. And we all know that widespread vaccination is really important to prevent the spread of COVID. Um, I think you've heard us talk before about herd immunity, and that's the big reason that we need to make sure that everybody gets vaccines. We want to reach herd immunity, and we don't want to do that by having people get sick and develop immunity. The vaccine is really the best way to do that. And in order for us to return back to some semblance of normal lives, we've got to get these vaccination rates to about 80%. So we still have a little ways to go when we're talking about about 30% of the United States being fully vaccinated. Um, I did want to start off with concerns that people have raised to us about the vaccine being rushed. Um, we hear a lot about concerns when we talk to people that they're not quite sure that the vaccine was studied well enough, that maybe there's not enough data. And I would like to speak to that a little bit to start out with. Um, in terms of the vaccines, remember, we still do have them available under what we call an emergency use authorization, or EUA, is how we refer to that. And what that means is the vaccine has gone through trials, multiple clinical trials. Um, at this point, the Pfizer vaccine has been out over six months, and they've looked at the data again, and it still looks very, very effective, 90% effective um, in the most recent studies over six months. Um, and the serious side effects um, have not been reported with Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Um, you may have heard about the J&J &J vaccine being paused. It is now reinstated with um, some warnings just to be sure that people are aware of serious blood clots um, that could occur with the J&J, &J, but those blood clots were very rare, less than one per million doses. So all of those preparations are available, the J&J, &J, the... Um, Moderna, the Pfizer vaccine for you to be given them at multiple events that we have. Um, the EUA process, that means that the FDA looked at all the data. It means that the CDC looks at all the data and ACIP, which is a special committee of the CDC. And they all looked at this data and safety and did come to the conclusion that the vaccine was safe. And that's why they released it. When we go through this process, the FDA um, rushes or pushes through the paperwork part, meaning that they don't make people wait um, to present this information to the FDA. That's why it goes through quickly. It's not that they skimped on the data, it's that they pushed through the paperwork more quickly. And a lot of the studies were done concomitantly. Usually we do one thing after another. In this situation, a lot of things were done at the same time and that also allowed the vaccines to come to market more quickly. So I am gonna ask Dr. Scholas a question. Um, and this question is about adverse effects for individuals with disabilities. Um, are there any adverse effects that we might be more concerned about in those with disabilities in comparison with the general population? Dr. Scholas. Thank you, Dr. Baumgarten. Thanks for having me and thanks for, for leading this conversation. Um, first, as a physician that takes care of kids and adolescents and young adults with acquired or congenital physical disabilities, it is refreshing to know that the community with disabilities is not an afterthought. Um, my patients aren't 
to be marginalized in that way. They aren't to be thought of after everyone else has quote unquote gone first. Um, so I think having this conversation is important. Um, second, I'd like to say that there is nothing inherent about anyone's physical disability that makes them more or less likely to have problems with any of these vaccines. So the, the, the barriers, if you will, are not medical, they're more structural and physical. So it's incumbent on us as providers and hospital systems to make sure that these sites are physically accessible. And also we have a mechanism to provide vaccines to people that aren't mobile and can't come to us, our sites. You know, the old saying is if uh, you can't bring Mohammed to the mountain, bring the mountain to Mohammed. And we're really doing that. And, I, and that makes a difference. We are. We are indeed trying to bring Mohammed to the mountain and vice versa. <laughs> so are there, can you discuss the risks and benefits of the vaccine for adults and children with um, disabilities? Sure, sure. Well, first of all, the uh, Pfizer vaccine is approved for everyone over the age of 16. The Moderna and J&J, &J, everyone over the age of 18. So the children we're talking about right now is a narrow sliver of more um, older adolescents and, and young adults. Um, but the benefits of this greatly outweigh the risks of anything, including the, the last scare about um, blood clots. And why do I say that? Vaccination is the key to us getting back to a typical life. That's the key to us being able to reopen schools fully. That's the key to us being able to get people back to work and jobs. And here in South Louisiana, it's the key to our entertainment and hospitality driven culture. We have a lot of people that make this world a better place that are waiting on you and waiting on everyone to get over that 80% mark of, of, of protection and safety. Agree completely. Um, you know, our culture is so dependent on um, being together, on being able to hold these festivals, on our entertainment, on our food, on the things that make Louisiana great and the people in Louisiana great. So we've got to get yes. back to being able to do the things that we want to do to get back to those sort of things that we all love and enjoy, the things that we um, feel like are the essence of Louisiana. Um, there may be some that are worried about sensory issues while getting the vaccine, maybe in a mass vaccination atmosphere or in an atmosphere um, where there may be lots of people getting vaccinated. Um, is there a recommendation at auctioner for those with concerns or maybe that need a little more assistance in getting vaccination, vaccinated? What I'm most happy about about this vaccine effort is it does two things. One, it helps get the volumes of people through to get vaccinated so we can get our numbers of where they want to go. I mean, New Orleans as a major city is one of the only major cities that has over half of its eligible population vaccinated at this point in time. And again, that sounds like a small thing, but in four months to go from nobody to almost half of the people that are available is remarkable. But as we do this to make sure that it's available to the masses, we also have to have the personal touch the personal touch to realize that some people won't do well in those big public vibrant settings like that. And I think that's why we are using and relying on smaller pharmacies, individual practitioners, offices, and in some cases going to people's homes to make sure that not only is the vaccine available medically and helping medically, but we deal with the sort of structural, environmental, and psychosocial needs of people that are barriers to them actually being able to say yes to the process. So again, to reinstate, we're pushing to get everybody there with these mass vaccination sites, but we're also making allowances for people where those sites just won't work. Um, we're tailoring this to make sure that everybody can be vaccinated no matter what your need. And that's our goal. We want to make sure that our community has that opportunity to get vaccinated no matter what. No matter what the situation, we want to get everybody, even one person to us is um, a victory. Absolutely. So we want to get every single person that we can vaccinated. And that's really our message and our goal. Um, I would also add to that, I've been at you know some of the mass vaccination events where we have the drive-throughs. And I don't know if people are familiar with those drive-throughs or if they've seen them maybe on the news or in the media, but it's amazing. Um, you know, you drive up, um, you register, and then you go through the line and there's a tent and an area where the nurses give the vaccines and then a waiting area where you park and just wait 15 minutes after the vaccine is given. It's a very quick process. The feedback has been really great that it works well, that people are often surprised at how well it does work. 
the other story I have from this is I was at the vaccine fest that we had about a month ago. And some of the nurses were telling me that, you know, they had a person that couldn't get their vaccine in the arm. So they made accommodations and made sure there was a way to give that person a vaccine in another area. So we really want to work with everybody as best as we can um, to get these vaccines to you. Um, and we do have all of these things that Dr. Scholl has talked about, the community events, the drive-through events, um, and we do have the ability to give that vaccine at multiple locations, clinics, that sort of thing as well. So Dr. Sure. Schulis, I, um, sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. No, um, no, no, please. But I, but I, I, I yeah. think that, that culturally, we are a 24 seven city here in New Orleans. Um, <laughs> you can eat anytime you want. You can go out and dance anytime you want. And I think we're working towards being a 24 seven healthy city where you can get vaccinated anytime you want and anywhere you want. Um, I think we have the ability and the technology with having three different options of vaccines that require three different sets of preparations and can go into different types of environments to really meet people where they are. Um, we've really done a great job as a culture and a city being available and always being the city of yes. I love that as, as a slogan. We're a city of N-O, but actually we're a city of yes. And I think we're translating that to the vaccine effort by being a city and a region of yes. However it works for you and your family and your loved ones, we want to be able to say yes. And we really want each and everyone listening to this to say yes to the vaccination process. Again, I apologize for interrupting Dr. Baumgart. No, 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 please. This is a discussion. We want to talk through um, a lot of things. And I do have a question too from uh, Tiffany. Tiffany asks, has the sure. pandemic affected people with disabilities different than the typical population? Um, what would you say to that, Dr. Schulis, or how would you help Tiffany with that question? That is an excellent question, Tiffany, and thank you. You know, people with disabilities are some of the most isolated persons in our society um, because they can't get out in some cases or don't have access to friends and culture. Um, this has been even more isolating. Um, because if you think about this, people with disabilities would leave their home for medical appointments, would leave their home for special activities, would leave their home for around um, big signature events. All of those elective visits to the hospital were suspended for several months. Most of those signature events have gone virtual or gone away altogether. So what I'm really concerned about with our population of persons with disabilities is isolation. Um, it's, it's, it's isolating because they have less social connectivity. And secondly, it's isolating because people are worried that they'll bring something to the persons with disabilities that will harm them. So it's a double whammy. And if you add that to the reality that a lot of our rural populations and many of our urban populations don't have Wi-Fi access that is sufficient to do an event like this, there isn't even a way for some of my people, places and kids to participate in these virtual events to make up for some of the things we're missing in person. Aside from those recreational or social or connectivity things, which are important, don't get me wrong, there's also the issue of school. A lot of children with special health care needs require one-on-one -on -one assistance to learn best. And it's very difficult to do some of that assistance remotely. So I've, I've been very concerned about our population with disabilities because of the social isolation and because they don't have as much access to the fundamental things they need to be viable, be integrated, and to be their best and most independent persons themselves. Right, and I also think it's important from a mental health standpoint too. There's a lot of grief. There's a lot of, like you said, isolation, and we really need to be aware of that um, in anybody and everybody and be addressing that as well and addressing those gr the, the needs that we have from a mental health standpoint as well. I think those are great That's points. That's an excellent point. Excellent point about yeah. grief. And I, and I, and I want to spend some time there because a lot of people are feeling off. They don't feel right. They can't put their finger on what's wrong. They, they don't necessarily feel sad or anxious or angry. They just feel something that's not their usual. And I identify and say to people, that's grief. You I do too, may because be I think we are not recognizing that enough. Yeah. Yes, yes. You're, I mean, you're recogn you're, you are mourning the death of real people that you loved and were affected by this disease, but you're also mourning your life. Um, not to make light of death, but 
I am 50, almost 51 years old, and I've been going to the Jazz and Heritage Festival since I was nine or 10 years old. So I haven't missed that event with my family for 40 years. And so not doing something that's a touch tone to my family and bringing us together and reminds us that we're New Orleanians wherever in the world we live, that's something that you have to mourn and grieve. So I, I remind people out there, able-bodied and those with disabilities, that we are all in a massive and collective cycle of grief, not just for the mm -hmm. loss of life, but the loss of our liberty, the loss of our freedom to walk around, the loss of our signature events, graduations, funerals, weddings, marriages, all those things that make us know we're people, um, we've been separated from. And, and those things that make us able to tolerate and get over and be resilient to setbacks, we had those taken away as well. So I think you're an excellent, excellent point, Dr. Barbara Garten. To, to I'm with you on Jazz there. Fest. I go every year too. So to me, that was a big deal as well. And I, I go for the mm -hmm. food, not just the music, the food. <laughs> Huge thing. I miss the food. Okay. So we have another question, Dr. Schillis. Um, Nikki is asking if is there any news on when vaccines for special needs kids under 16 will be available. So and right I can, now, sure, you, 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 can, you can start out with that one and I'll, and I'll, I'll back clean up. Sure, doctor. Right. So um, we're looking, hopefully, in the next few weeks, we think that um, there'll be data from um, Pfizer going to the FDA for groups 12 to 15. So we're hopeful in the next few weeks, we may have the emergency use authorization. That's the process that we talked about earlier for those age groups. And then, you know, there's lots of um, studies being done in kids and you can check um, websites, that sort of thing. If you are interested in research trials, that those might be available um, if that's something that you're interested in. And Dr. Schillis, if you have anything to add that maybe I forgot or missed. Oh, no, you, you did an excellent job of covering it. But I also want to remind our parents out there that as a parent, you are programmed and hardwired to put your kids first. You're programmed to really make sure you think about your kids before you think about yourself. And what's really hard about this COVID pandemic is that this is the one time where you should worry about yourself and your parents before you worry about your children. Um, and, and, and that's almost sacrilege to say out loud, but in terms of relative risk, um, I'm worried about my parents out there. I'm worried about my grandparents, my aunties and my uncles out there. It's not that kids aren't important, but if we have to start where the people are dying most, where people are having problems the most, we have to focus on our adults and get our adults under control. Because even if we, pr we protect our kids, but all the adults die, what happens? How does that leave us? Well, it's, it's know, like when you're in an airplane, right? And they tell you to put the oxygen on yourself first so you can breathe and then yes. take care of your child, right? So. Yes. Okay. We're the we do have another question. Sure. Right, right. So um, I do have another question from Sandy. Um, how are the reports with allergic reactions on persons with special needs? Um, she has a child that's semi vegetative and cannot communicate is if he is having an allergic reaction or an issue with allergic reaction? Excellent question. Thank you for asking. Um, and also, you know, Dr. Baumgartner is an expert in this area, so I will not pretend to man speak over her for this one. So do you want to talk about <laughs> an allergy first? I'll back clean up again. Sure, sure. So the most common reactions with the vaccine are really um, some arm pain and tenderness. And honestly, when I got my vaccine, I had a little bit of that. It was very mild. Um, and so if you have a child that may not be able to express that to you, maybe if they turn a certain way and you can tell by their facial expressions, maybe they're a little tender um, and you can use whatever pain reliever you normally would. The other thing that can sometimes happen is um, people, it's pretty normal for people to have a low grade fever. Um, they may have a little bit of chills. That's your body mounting an immune response. That's normal. That's what we expect to happen with any vaccine for you to mount an immune response. So if you're exposed to COVID, then your body knows, hey, I've seen this before. I'm not gonna be sick. I'm gonna fight this off. And that's why you don't get sick once you have the vaccine. But yes, it can lead to a little bit of fever, some headache. Um, in terms of the allergic reaction, which is I really think the question that you were asking, Sandy, um, allergic reactions, it may be, a, um, it's very rare. Let me just say, first of all, 
um, there were some allergic reactions reported rarely, less than one per million doses of the vaccine. And there's not been any additional concern about that um, in the recent past, in the past few months. But that would be something like maybe difficulty breathing or swelling. So you would just monitor for 15 to 30 minutes after that vaccine and be sure that there was no difficulty breathing or swelling of the face or lips or rash. Um, but again, this is a very rare um, reaction and it mostly occurred in those that had had previous allergic reactions to multiple medications. So people that had lots of allergies to different medications is the risk group. So I hope that helps with your question. Um, and then let me see if there were, okay, so I think we're good on those questions for now. Let me go back to the other um, questions that we had as well. Um, so Dr. Schulis, you did mention this, but let's just revisit it. I hope that everybody, I just wanna be clear with everybody about um, the age groups that currently we can give the vaccines to. So what ages are we able to give vaccines to um, now? Sure, right now we're able to use the um, Pfizer vaccine on anybody 16 and older, and the Johnson & Johnson and Moderna vaccines, anybody 18 and older. Um, you might ask yourself well, again, why are, they, why are they age group limiting this? When, when you set up the process of studying um, whether vaccines help and actually don't hurt you, you have to be very rigorous in terms of putting those groups together. And as we talked about earlier, we're putting the life masks on the people that are most affected first. So adults were the people that were really going down. For whatever reason, this isn't like the flu or other viral respiratory infections that really go through children and then secondarily get to adults. This was really, really affecting adults, way out of proportion to children. That's why the groups started the research there. That research is continuing. To, to make that, to see what happens in children as young as 12. And I bet you when we get past that, we'll continue to extend it even younger than that. But, but I think what I want to remind everybody here is that this is a new process. We didn't have these words, places, and spaces 18 months ago, okay? Uh, this is the gestation period of an elephant. You know, we, we, <laughs> like, we are, to put this in, in the string, we've gone from nothing to delivering an elephant. Um, over a very, very short time. And what does that mean for us? That means we are understanding the words, we're understanding the risks, we're understanding the benefits, we're understanding who needs special attention in the process. And to talk a little bit more about the J&J &J pause, a lot of people said that made them nervous, but to me, that showed that the system was working as it's intended. Something that was happening in less frequently than one in 1.2 to 1.5 million cases, okay? So again, you could vaccinate 3 million people and only two folks would have this pop up. For us to be able to resolve that, identify it, and look closely at it very quickly in real time, showed you that the process of examining these vaccines, their efficacy and their safety is happening like it's supposed to. I want them to pause ask a couple of extra questions, and then go back to driving. That's what was supposed to happen. And that's how the system demonstrates it's working for you, even if you have something that's unusual and rare. I completely agree. I think that um, it is a testament to the system working that we caught something so rare and that they did pause and look at it and then determine, hey, we've looked at it. We're going to use the vaccine, we consider it to be safe, and this is a rare event. Um, and they will continue to do that. That's planned for the next few years to have that degree of scrutiny and safety in place so that if anything is seen, they will let us know about it and we'll know about it. The other thing I would mention, um, Dr. Schulis, is that we participated in the studies for Pfizer. And so those studies, the data that we have from that Pfizer trial are based on our people in our community. So those of us here in Louisiana participated in that trial and contributed to that information that led to the EUA for the Pfizer vaccine. So that's based on our own people in our area. And there is a question about how long will it take after I get the shot to be fully immune? So for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, you have to have those two shots for Pfizer at zero and 21 days. 
Moderna zero in 28 days, and then you're considered mm -hmm. 14 days after that completely protected. And then for the J&J &J vaccine, remember, that's just the one dose, which is why a lot of people really like it, is that you just have to do that one dose, and then you're considered fully protected 14 days after that vaccine as well. And Dr. Schulis, um, who would need their caregivers present in order to get the vaccine? Can adults getting the Excellent. vaccine have their caregivers with them? That's the next question Excellent we're being question. asked. Yes. So, you know, in any situation where children are below the age of consent getting the vaccine, they're going to need their parents with them. The one exception to that would be an emancipated minor. Those are very specialized circumstances and situations, and you know who you are. Um, but for unemancipated minors, unless you are of the age of consent, you need to have your parent with you. If you have someone that you have medical power of attorney on or legal power of attorney over because they need help with big decisions, you need to be present with them to provide consent. Although that person may be able to give assent um, if they're able, um, they need someone that can provide true consent that's acting to support their health interests. Um, so if you have someone that you work with for a regular surgical procedure, or if you have someone that you work with to give permission for any sort of hospital-based or, 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 or invasive process, you want that person to be present with you during this vaccine process as well. And there are available options to make sure that your caregiver um, or your provider or your parent or your guardian is present during these um, times. There's nothing that prohibit, prohibits that. There's nothing that we don't recognize or respect about that. Excellent question. Right, we understand that you, sometimes we need that support. We need that support person to be there, to be present, to help, uh, to make that um, other person comfortable. So we are on board with that and um, would want you to bring that support person or have that support person there. There's another question Sandy is asking if there's a preferred vaccine um, that she should be allowed to give her son. I'll just start off by saying it depends on the age of your son. We talked a little bit about the age differences. Dr. Scholes just uh, spoke to that. But whatever vaccine is most convenient and easily available is what we've recommended. Dr. Scholes, do you have any other, um, anything else to add to that or comment? You know, everybody asks questions about which one is better. I think, you know, that sort of bred into us. I want the best. I want the best. But the easiest way to think about this, this is Nike versus Adidas versus Reebok. There's going to be some people that love and, and swear by Nike, some people that love and swear by Adidas, and some people that love and swear by Reebok but all of them are good shoes that have high performance um, track records that, that are tested well for their athletic sports and abilities and leisure wear, and all of them are comfortable on feet. So I, I, I say that to say to you that whatever vaccine is able to get to you in your community, go for it. Um, and you say, why would there be a difference? Okay, the J&J &J vaccine does not require any special refrigeration, a re special freezing. It actually can be stored at a refrigerator, so you can transport that vaccine places without any special equipment. Um, and so that makes that vaccine, especially because it's a one shot, something that if you have to go to someone's home, it's much easier to transport that J&J &J than some of the other types. Um, whereas if you're near a big tertiary care medical center like the Oxford Main Campus, there is nothing about the storage of the Pfizer shot, even though it requires cool temperatures of this, that, and the other, that we can't achieve or accomplish. So if you're near a place that can store a vaccine that requires a little special care, that's what you'll get. If you're actually in a place that, that is not near one of those locations, you're going to get a vaccine that doesn't require that much fussiness to get it into your arm. Um, whatever shows up has been tested, has been tried, and is true. So don't quibble. And I would add to that, all, Nike, go ahead. Reebok, all of these or, vaccines. Or, or, or get it. Yeah. And all of these vaccines, the most important thing to me is they prevent people from dying. We know that all of these vaccines have been shown over and over and over again to prevent death. And that to me and to, I think, Dr. Scholes, when we've seen people die and maybe you and your community and your family have yeah. died from COVID, to me, that is the most important thing we can do is prevent death and prevent people from needing to be in the hospital and being terribly ill. Um, so how can one get a vaccine? Where, where does one go to find out availability and to set up an appointment? 
Um, Dr. Schulz, do you want to take this one or you want me to speak to it? You can speak to it and I'll talk about the city resources right after that. Okay, perfect. Um, so we are hosting, as we mentioned before, many community events. Um, they're all over the region. We also are having the drive-through mass vaccination events. Um, to get that information, if you have access to um, the computer, you can visit auctioner.org slash vaccine info to see where the latest events are. Um, the other way to find out is to schedule an appointment by calling our um, vaccine line. I'm going to give you that number twice right now, and then I'll give it to you again at the end if you need to go get something to write it down with or remember it with. Um, and that number is 844-888-2772. Again, that number is 844-888-2772. Um, and you can just call and we'll help you figure out what is the best option for you and help you schedule that appointment. And then if you would like to set up an auctioner account, you can go to auctioner.org slash my auctioner. So Dr. Schulis, what is auctioner doing to help people with disabilities have access to the vaccines? You know, if you are homebound, um, we can actually arrange to have someone come to your home and actually deliver the vaccine. So those of you that are mobility limited or have trouble getting from point A to point B, Oxner has a plan for you, and I love that. Um, if you require an environment that's not the big mass vaccination sites because you want a more personal touch or something a little more quiet and something a little more restrained, that's available. To those of you in Orleans Parish, you can go to NOLA Ready, N-O-L-A-R-E-A-D-Y, NOLA Ready. Um, and that lists not just statistics about vaccines and COVID infections, but it tells you where the centers to get vaccinated are in Orleans Parish. Now, Orleans Parish is a little different than some of the other surrounding parishes because we're one of the only parishes to have its own health department, whereas most parishes health department issues run through the state agencies um, and administered at the parish level. So um, NOLA Ready if you're in Orleans Parish or go to the um, state health department website as well. So there's lots and lots of options out there. And I love that Dr. Baumgarten gave some low-tech options to buy the phone. So those of you that, that know someone that needs help, but they aren't necessarily computer savvy, that should not be a barrier. If you know someone put internet at that house, that should not be a barrier. And I think Oxner providing a phone line, low-tech with navigators to help people is really, really peeling away layers of barriers that can keep people that need vaccines away from them just because of their living circumstance. And I have another story. I was in New York uh, several weeks ago and met a person that was from Louisiana and his grandmother who was 90 had not yet gotten her vaccine. And she was in North Louisiana and I was able to give him this number. She did not have the computer. She was 90. She did not want to have to deal with getting onto the computer, but I was able to give her grandson this number and have him help her call and get vaccinated. Um, I hope that I, I didn't hear back. I hope she got vaccinated, um, but you know, no matter where you are, you can share this, share this number. It doesn't have to be an auctioner patient, just have them call. We will try to get the vaccine done for anybody that needs it. Um, so, you know, what I love about that story, Dr. Go ahead. Do you have final words? Go ahead. What I love about that story is the importance of family. A grandson was looking out for his grandmother. Caregivers are out there looking for their caretaker, the, the, the people they're providing care for. Aunts and uncles are looking out for their nieces and nephews. Nieces and nephews are looking out for their titties and their parents. I'm telling you, this is a community effort. And I want to ask each and every one of you out there listening to this can hear the sound of my voice. Don't just take care of yourself, but advocate for your friends, your family and your loved ones, because we all need to get together. and We all need to have vaccines. If you care for or care about someone with a special health care needs, go the extra mile to reach out to them and make sure they know how to navigate this process. And if they can't navigate the process on their own, help them call for them, help them get online. We need everybody in this effort. And sometimes people like that grandson 
are the difference between that 90 year old being with us to celebrate their 100th anniversary versus us celebrating them in the grave. Um, we need everyone and we really appreciate everyone's attention and time for this. And Dr. Schultz, we really appreciate you being here today. Um, it's been a pleasure to be able to talk with you. And I don't think we have any other questions. So I want to thank all of you for joining us today on this Facebook Live event. I want to thank our ASL interpreters for being here to help us as well. Um, really a pleasure to work with all of you today. Um, for more information about the vaccine, please visit auctioner.org slash vaccine. Um, remember, we're continuing to do the social distancing, the masking to keep everybody safe. Um, I know there's been some recent changes in that, but we are continuing to use those masks to help protect others. And I am gonna leave you with that number, 844-888-2772. Um, Again, 844-888-2772. And Dr. Scholes is demonstrating his great mask use. So thanks again, everybody. We appreciate you taking your time and joining us today. Um, please join us in the future, save those questions. And if you have any, um, save them for future events. Thanks so much and hope you have a great afternoon.